Okay. <laughs> it's funny when you leave the screen, you can no longer see anyone. <laughs> Welcome everyone. Uh, my name is Emmy Bartholomew and I am the Sergeant at Arms for our club. I'd like to welcome everyone. And we usually start our meetings with the Pledge of Allegiance. Uh, so I'm going to play the Pledge of Allegiance to the United States of America, and you are welcome to join. There is no pressure. You do not have to join us. So I am going to share my screen now. Sure I am. I mean, we can't hear the sound. Oh, okay. Sorry. I forgot to play the sound. So we'll run through that real quickly one more time. Oh. That wasn't it. <laughs> that was Here we amusing. <laughs> I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Okay. There's always such a challenge with these wonderful technical things. So I would now like to turn this meeting over to our Toastmaster for the day. And where are you? Sandra. I knew you were there somewhere. Sandra Cole will be our Toastmaster today. And let's welcome Sandra. Well, thank you, Emmy. And thank you for opening the meeting. Before I come on, I would like to turn it over to our president, Abhiji, for a few words. Abhiji. Thank you so much, Sandra. So we are professionally speaking club in this club. We create value for our members. We give 15 minutes of evaluations for each and every speaker. We have a manual evaluation. We have a vocal. We have a visual. And we have a content as well as round robin. So thank you for joining us today. Sandra has put an amazing program today. Let's enjoy it. Back to you, Sandra. Thank you, Abhiji. Welcome Toastmasters and guests to our humor meeting. The goal is to laugh and to learn. We learn best in moments of enjoyment, according to our founder, Dr. Ralph Smedley. Before we proceed, there are a few meeting logistics. I'd like to bring up our Area 23 Director, Joanna Travera, who is our timer tonight. And Joanna, would you please demonstrate the timing signals now? Thank you. Joanna? There we go. Go ahead. <laughs> so thank you again for inviting me. I am the Area 23 Director. However, I'm not here in the, in the capacity of the Area 23 Director. I'm just visiting as a guest. 
So thank you for allowing me to have a role in your meeting. I'm serving as your timer this evening. Huh. As your timer, there are certain segments that will be timed and measured. For speeches, there are four to six minutes. At four minutes, you will see a variation of green. When you reach five minutes, you will see a variation of yellow. And when you reach your six minutes, you will see a variation of red. Some of you will get the golden ticket, and some of you will know that you're way over time when we show you the curtain. For, you. Our, for our round robin, there's five to six minutes, and we will show a variation of those colors that I just showed you. For table topics, it's one to two minutes. At one minute, you will get a variation of the green. At one and a half, you'll get a variation of the yellow. And at two minutes, you'll get a variation of the red. The general evaluator will be timed, and let's see how well we do. Thank you, Madam Toastmaster. Thank you, Joanna. Now, everyone who has a timed meeting tonight, now would be a very good time for you to locate the timer and move the image of the timer to your top left-hand corner of the screen. Because once our Zoom master, Lindy McLean, enables spotlighting, you will no longer be able to move the participant images around on your device. So please do that now. And everyone presenting on the agenda, please watch the agenda for your time to speak. And please be ready and waiting in the wings for your turn when it's announced. The agenda is full and transitions will move quickly. Sandra, I have now got everyone unspotlighted. So I'm sorry I was delayed on that. So you can go to gallery view and drag the timer to the left-hand corner, everyone now. So thank you. All right. So we'll just take a moment to do that. All right. Are we ready? <laughs> Thank you. Shh. I have a secret. I'm not funny. Postmasters and guests, the good news, funny can be learned. If I can craft humor, then you certainly can craft humor. Tonight, we will review some of the favorite and easiest strategies I have to craft humor for your very next speech. I hope you like easy. I certainly do. Do you have my handout? If so, now's the time to open it. Please see it located in the chat. Members, you can find the link in the meeting notes box. And for our guests, it will be on your Eventbrite announcement right next to your Zoom link and the meeting agenda link. This will be interactive tonight. I'm looking forward to your responses. You can use chat or raise your hand and unmute, and I'll call on you to share your answers. How does that sound? Okay. As speakers, we often hear that humor is very important to speeches or even lighter moments depending upon the topic, even a eulogy. But why, why is humor important? What are your ideas? Let's hear from you. Why is humor important? Anyone unmute? Abhijit. It lightens the mood. It lightens the mood, absolutely. It provides comic relief. Especially in the heavier speeches, we need to have lighter moments for sure. And certainly in a eulogy, which I mentioned, but in speeches, we have the ups and downs, the emotional ups and downs. So thank you. Anyone else? Why humor? It's important to, it's important to keep the audience engaged. Otherwise they would come to that uh, audience. The audience would just go to sleep. <laughs> 
All right, it's very, and right, thank you so much. I just, it's very important to engage the audience. Is that what you're saying? To keep them with you so that they hear your message. Uh, yes. Yes, Terry, why else humor? I think it's very connecting for people around the world. Oh, absolutely. It connects speakers with their message. And when you're connected, um, your audience will hear your message. Any other reasons why we use humor? Yes, Arun. Uh, because it's good for mental health. It's good for mental health. Absolutely. Totally aligned to science. They feel better. <laughs> yes, I agree. Well, for the purposes of tonight, and as you shared, we have many reasons to use humor. But I see especially that it's very, very important to build rapport with your audience so they receive your message. It keeps the audience listening. It provides comic relief. But humor, very importantly, makes your point stick. It's what the audience remembers tomorrow morning, one week, or even a year from now. So it helps move your speech along and keeps the topic uh, engaged with the audience. Well, the very important and overall strategy for humor uh, success is obviously to be spontaneous. It's whatever first comes into our mind, our heart, and what flows out of our lips, because that's where we find the funny. And it's really great if you have a humor buddy to brainstorm with, capture all those things that are just pouring out of you, and you will find poignant, very funny phrases to use in your humor. My favorite strategy, <laughs> I'm starting with my favorite, and easiest for me is the series of three, the list of three. And it goes like this. The first two points are serious. And then the third one twists. It's unexpected. It's funny. For example, it's a scary world out there. There's war, inflation, and asparagus. <laughs> I am so sorry. <laughs> That's my take on humor. Okay, another example. For my trip to Florida's Everglades, I took sunscreen, sunglasses, and an alligator. <laughs> now it's your turn. Look at the blank, number one on your handout. On my vacation to the beach, I took, what would you take, realistic? Anyone? A mute, what would you take? Toothbrush. To the beach, what would you take? Yes, um, as Jamal. Yes, a trip to my beach, I took beach ball. I took swimsuit and a suitcase. <laughs> okay, very, very good. Anyone else want to try that one? Well, let's go on to the let's go on to the next line. Oh yes. Oh uh, yes, Raju, would you like to I, try? I took soap, shampoo, and Jennifer Lopez to the beach. <laughs> <laughs> All right, you you have the hang of this well. Very good. Oh, would you like to try the next one? Number two, there, there are three subtle clues your relationship is over when, and we could just have just one item, one first item. Anybody? What would be a clue your relationship's over? You fight all the time. Okay, you're fighting. Number two, what else? The locks have been changed. Oh, the locks have been changed. And number three. What would be the twist? My clothes are on the highway. <laughs> okay, there you go. Very, very good. That, wonderful. Now, strategy number two is exaggeration. And you start with something realistic for the setup, and then you get to exaggerate big or small. Often I thought of 
always big, but small can have great impact as well. So for example, I was bitten by a mosquito. I had a scar the size and shape of a weasel. Number two, scientists finally know why dinosaurs went extinct. It's because their mothers forced them to eat broccoli. Now let's look at the example. It's been announced, and this is true, that wild cherry jello has been discontinued because, exaggerate. Oh, I hear- Wild cherries suck. <laughs> Anyone else? Oh, excuse me, I, I did not hear you. All right, anyone else? All right, if you think if you think of more, you can put them into chat, please. Number two, scientists discovered a puzzling new planet that. All right, Judy. Orbits backwards around the sun. <laughs> All right, Emmy. Only shows up on Valentine's Day. <laughs> Oh, very good. Anyone else want to try? Well, I said because it's made up of wild cherry jello. <laughs> That's where it all went. <laughs> Sorry. And then uh, let's see, strategy number three, self-deprecation half and half. In humor, we can always poke fun of ourselves. And I found this is a very simplified and easy technique to come up with something creative. The tip is to start to list qualities of, that are unique to you. It could be your interests. You could, and um, also a good tip is to use two columns. So it could be your interests, your hobbies, or any other categories that you want to set up side by side. They don't have to be entirely true, however. But a shred of truth really does help draw your audience in. Choose only two of the qualities and fill them into each of those blanks, half and half. For example, you may not know this, but I'm half nerd and half artist. That means I love to paint by numbers. That's how it works. <laughs> Another example I came up for me, you may not know this. I'm half French, I'm half American. That means I love gourmet fast food. Does anyone want to try one? You may not know this, I'm half, Or we just show a term out there. Maybe somebody can finish it for you. Terry? I'm half Sagittarian and half Virgo. That means I'm a perfectionist wannabe that doesn't have a chance. <laughs> All right. Very good. Oh, here we have one in chat from Raju. I'm half numerologist and half... Whoops, it disappeared. Well, I'm sorry. And... And how I'm half numerologist and half artist, that makes me a nudist artist. Oh, yeah. Yes. Nice. <laughs> nice. Yes. Anyone else? I'm half. Yes, I no. am. I am half Cancer and a half Leo, and that makes me to oscillate between two ends extremely vigorously. <laughs> All right, thank you. Oh my goodness. 
I'm half Grimchian and half collector. That means I'm from Who Whoville. <laughs> I hope I pronounced that correctly. <laughs> half bulldog and half Shih Tzu. That makes me, oh my goodness. <laughs> All right. So <laughs> I'll censor that word. <laughs> Thank you. You have it down really well. So it's really a great one to have fun to play with uh, when you come up with your self-deprecating humor. And in closing, let's look at the overriding strategy, humor intelligence. Especially nowadays, it's very important to know your audience and know the occasion. So we can determine the words and choice of humor that will be well received at that point in time and not offend others to the culture of that organization or that audience. And the second point is to use humor to connect, not divide. Humor connects, jokes divide, poke fun at yourself, not others. It's all in that same plane. That's where self-deprecating humor can be very important. And then use your own material. Audiences remember where they've heard it elsewhere or where they've read it elsewhere. So keep those in mind. You have the techniques down right. If you have any questions, ask. And most importantly, find yourself a humor buddy and have fun. Now, moving on um, before the speeches. Uh, the audience would you please observe how each speaker uses humor? What humor strategies do they use? Are there others? How do they develop their humor? Observe. And then during the round robin time, you'll have time to share your feedback. What humor worked for you? What did you really like, your favorite parts? Or not like so much and why? And are there the ways humor could be strengthened? Now, before we move into the introductions, all speakers, can you see the timer? Oh, Mike Maddox, can you see the timer? Yes. All right, wonderful. All speakers? All right, very good. So please be waiting in the wings and be ready for your turn during the introduction. The transitions will be fast. And now for speaker introductions, our first speaker tonight is Michael Maddox. Many of you know that Michael Maddox is married and retired, but do you know that he pickles? Please help me welcome Michael Maddox for his speech, Pickleball and Marriage. Pickleball and Marriage, Michael. Who am I, this wonderful feeling? I'm so high, I swear I can fly. I'm Michael Maddox, I'm married, retired, and I pickle. Not pickle in the sense of sitting on a shelf and preserving my wrinkles, but no, playing pickleball, the fastest growing sport in the United States where there's no racket, <laughs> that's his going sport in the United States and the official sport of Washington State. Pickleball, what is it? It's a cross between ping pong and tennis, but without the muscle lunging, spraining, lunging that occurs in tennis, nor the Serena Williams-like hypersonic shot to the corner. Mr. Madam Toastmaster, fellow Toastmasters and guests. Pickleball is okay, even for us 50, 60, 70 year olds, like some of you in the audience, like me, us over the hillers, we're able to flourish on the pickleball court. But pickleball and marriage, how's it gonna get to that? Well, I'll tell you, it all started when I was sitting at the edge of the pickleball court, taking a break. And I heard a woman after she'd shot into the net go, I'm sorry. To which her colleague said, 
you don't have to say you're sorry in pickleball. And I thought, you don't have to say you're sorry in pickleball. That is so unlike marriage. Oh my gosh, I'm sorry is a survival phrase in marriage. So, so, then I thought, marriage, pickleball, oh, that's it. That's my speech. It's going to write itself. So let's get to it. First, a little history. Pickleball was invented in Washington State, Bainbridge Island, by two men trying to entertain their bored families, increase the heart rate. Marriage was invented by God in heaven, trying to calm the passions of a man and woman, to slow the heart rate. So there's similarities and differences, but I want to go over that big, unique difference, that titanic, gargantuan, humongous, amazing difference. That is that I don't have to say sorry in pickleball and you do in marriage. So guys, and I noticed there's very few guys in the audience here. <laughs> but anyways, guys, this is for you. I am sorry needs to become as reflexive as passing the paddle in front of your face when you're at a furious volley in front of the net to protect. But you gotta practice. Everything you have to do, you have to practice. So let's do it, guys. Okay, ready? I'll say, I am sorry, you repeat, ready? I am sorry. Okay, your turn. I okay, again. <laughs> All right. I am sorry. Again, repeat. I oh, am I sorry. sorry. <laughs> it's got to become a survival reflex. I mean, there should be added to the balance to hold, cherish, and protect. And I'm sorry. So you know at the get go where you're going. So that, let's look at a few other similarities. First, picklers are social, gracious, and forgiving. Marriages are, oh, they're that way too. Some of the good ones. Experienced, if you're playing with a, kind of an experienced, there's different levels of pickleball too. You can play with an experienced player or a novice player. If you're playing with a novice player, you want to be able to return the uh, return the, uh, that player's uh, serve easily so that they can get it, return it back easily. It's participatory. Everybody's having a lot of fun. Now, in marriage, you kind of want those same qualities too. And there are some divine husbands that are able to accomplish it. But I will tell you right now, you, Toastmaster, me, I am only semi-divine. But when you're playing versus an experienced player, you might want to drive the ball hard and down the line or maybe to the left and then suddenly to the right unexpectedly so that your opponent flails, is unbalanced and has no clue where you're coming from. Flailing, unbalanced, no clue where you're coming from. Bad strategy in marriage. Hits to the head, bad in marriage, bad in pickleball. Thinking back and forth, nice and soft. Oh yeah, that's pretty comfortable. That's good, everybody enjoys that. You might see a congratulatory good shot to your pickleball partner, but in your wife, those words might be ill chosen, not the choice. You might say to your wife, you look ravishing. Oh, you're the one that I love, the one that I love. Ooh, 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 honey. But that really wouldn't fly on the pickleball court. Now, picklers do have something called round robin where we switch partners every 12 minutes or so. That's how we picklers roll. But if I suggested that to my wife, she might go, no, 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 honey. <laughs> she wouldn't like the round robin. Paddles, if you slam them on the court, wow, that's a penalty. You are off the court in marriage that is divorced. We sometimes in pickleball tap paddles at the end of the game, kind of a congratulatory, I'm enjoying this. I'd love to play with you again. And the... Uh, if I say, use that same sort of scene in, uh, in uh, well, in, in marriage, the phrase to death to us apart kind of raises the stakes. So it's not quite as voluntary, easy, that sort of thing, raises the stakes. So in marriage, in pickleball, if I use that same phrase, tap the paddle and say, till death do us apart, I might get kind of a strange look about it. But pickling is not profound. The funny word tells you that. If you do flub in pickleball, though, by going too short or not far enough, you don't have to say, I'm sorry, it's not part of the culture. However, if a man is off his game in marriage, or even if he's just in the game, 
He has got to have that phrase, I am sorry, down. Pickleball and marriage, similar but different. I'm Michael Maddox, I'm married, I'm retired, and I pickle. I'm so high, I swear I can fly. Madam Toastmaster. <laughs> Thank you, Michael, for telling us the similarities and the differences of pickleball, <laughs> marriage, and the vows. <laughs> Our second speaker this evening is Tom Jacobs. Tom Jacobs recently spent some time in London seeing the sights, places of fame and infamy. Um, join him as he spins a tale of misadventure, crime, and punishment. Please welcome Tom for Crime and Punishment Sent to the Tower. Tom Jacobs. Need to unmute. Yeah. Thank you, Madam Toastmaster. Can you hear me now? Awesome. Great. I only do this like 50,000 times a day. Um, so, you know, here we are. The sun blasted down on the sweltering courtyard. The temperature was over 106 Fahrenheit and the humidity was atrocious. My wife and her entourage had left me to rest on a park bench as they explored the other parts of the castle and keep of the infamous Tower of London. Not 20 feet away was a glass pillow commemorating the punishment of Anne Boleyn, the famous wife of King Henry VIII. But now I was the one losing my head because I had lost my phone in the courtyard of the Tower of London. Where did it go? So the heat was scorching. People were queued up for over half an hour to view the royal jewels. There's also what looked like an equally long line at the water fountain. So I witnessed not just, was what, what, not just the changing of the guard, I also witnessed the ceremonial watering of the guards because these guards weren't supposed to move so other guardsmen marched up to them and poured water into their mouths like a little baby bird that was pretty funny i fell for them of course because it was really hot and those red uniforms were not meant for the heat this is London, after all. It doesn't get that hot. It was record. It was record breaking that week. And I say this just to set the stage. And speaking of that baby bird thing, there are ravens all over the place. They're kept at the tower. They're raised at the tower. And there, there are all kinds of signs everywhere that say, "Caution: the ravens will bite you." But they were taunting me as I rushed around looking for my phone. I need to find my phone. Where is it? My brain was going over every inch of time for the past 10 minutes. The last time I knew I had it was when I was getting water at that water fountain. My heart was in my throat. The last 12 years of my life was on that phone. It connected me to everything, everything. Was this my punishment for always having my phone out? Fitting, uh, fitting place here at the tower where justice was meted out? I stared one of the ravens in the eye and I asked him, where is my phone? When will I find it? Nevermore was the only line of response from the giant. Uh, bird as he cocked his head defensively, or actually, sorry, not defensively, derisively, and flew off. I'm pretty sure he knew where it was. I'm pretty sure he was in on it. Looking around, I saw another raven from his murder chase after a small child. I'm not sure he was doing it just to be mean, but it could have been trying to take her shining shoes that flashed every time she stepped. 
They look like they like shiny things. I wonder. After, after searching for 20 more minutes and enlisting the rest of my party in the search, we still couldn't find the phone. We gave up and left. My sorrow deepening as I felt the shame and panic of loss. After telling my story to others, the consensus is that it was probably stolen. There are a lot of pickpockets in London, after all. I'm pretty sure they're right. Because the next time my phone was turned on, it was in Egypt. Most say it was human themes, thieves, but my money is on the Ravens. Madam Toastmaster. Thank you, Tom, for sharing the challenges of the last phone and the mischief of the Ravens at the Tower of London. Our third speaker this evening is Alana Brenna. Many of you already know that Elena is both a writer and an editor. I'm excited to announce tonight that she agreed to give us a preview of our next nonfiction book project, The Rules for Lasting Love. Help me welcome Elena for her speech, The Rules for Lasting Love. Well, thank you, Madam Toastmaster. As you can see, I brought in a few, just a few of the self-help books from my shelves. My fellow Toastmasters, you're familiar with the self-help genre. You've read them. I've read them. I've bought them and I have given them to others. In fact, I even edited one. Now, I bet I could write a self-help book. I'd call it The Rules for Lasting Love. I, after nearly 20 years of marriage to my husband, Tony, after nearly 40 years with my husband, Tony, I am a subject matter expert. In fact, Tony says, I am always right. Or is that just a survival tactic on his part? <laughs> his exact words are that I always think I'm right. Whether I'm right or just think I'm right, I know enough and I'm expert enough to write the book on the rules for lasting love. Why should I be intimidated by the tens of thousands of self-help books that are published every year? Like those others, mine will have advice and examples. How about a sample tonight? Health is important. In fact, I learned an important lesson about health because if you're going to have a long lasting relationship, your partner has to stay alive. The important lesson I learned was when Tony was driving me to a Toastmasters event, he asked whether I had anything for a headache. I was a woman with a purse and a purpose. I dove in. And I came up with two aspirin, which I took. <laughs> We're close. But no matter how close we are, if I take the aspirin, it doesn't cure his headache. So here's your health rule. If your partner has a pain and you take the medication, it doesn't help your partner. How about another rule? This one could help you maintain your house as well as your relationship. Never let your spouse fix the plumbing, unless you married a plumber, or you really, really like mopping and mopping and mopping. I'm gonna save that story for the book. Let's just say that luckily, 
I married for love, not plumbing skills. And love is the real story here. Wise people have said, in fact, that human beings are put on this planet with the sole purpose of loving one another. So it's not just romantic love. It's not always easy. As one philosopher says, I love humanity. It's people I can't stand. But if you're going to love people, you need to have a sense of humor, especially in a marriage. The most important rule is to laugh together every day. Tony and I could never have made it as far as we have without a shared sense of humor. We laugh every day, sometimes at each other, but mostly with each other. Let me tell you, just last month, there was a terrible thunderstorm at our place and lightning was flashing and thunder was crashing all around our house. And our house sits up on a high point. We've been hit by lightning before. Now our dog, Kalia, I noticed was going down into the basement. I said to Tony, Kalia is really smart. He said, yeah, she's the smartest dog we've ever had. Now we were headed upstairs. Tony was going to get into the shower. So the dog is smart, she's going downstairs. We're on our way up to the highest point in the house. What does that make us? I had a sudden urge. I said, lightning, strike us now. Tony looked at me. Have you lost your bloody mind? Imagine if I'm killed while I'm in the shower. You'll feel guilty for the rest of your life. Yeah, but it'll make a great story. He laughed. Then my journalist husband gave me his highest compliment. Now you're thinking like a journalist. <laughs> That's real love in my book. Speaking of my book, don't look for the rules for lasting love to be on the shelves anytime soon. No, I'm not going to write that book. As a matter of fact, I'm giving up self-help books. You and I don't need a book to remember the most important rule. That is to laugh together every day with those you love. But if you insist on a book, Help yourself. Madam Toastmaster. Thank you, Elena, for sharing your rules for lasting love. What I got from that was to uh, never let your spouse be the plumber <laughs> and laughing every day. Thank you so much. Well, we are running behind schedule. So what we will do is we will shorten Michael Nile. We will shorten the table topics at this point and we'll shorten this round robin. Let's time the round robin for four minutes, please. If we can have all three speakers on the screen. All right, so audience, if you have feedback to Michael, Tom and Elena, please share your tips. You can share them in chat or invoice. Does anyone have feedback to the speakers? And I am not, let's see if I can bring up gallery. Here we go. I does, yes, Judy, did you have your hand up? No, she did not. Anyone? I didn't, I didn't, but I'll, I'll give some feedback. All right, thank you. I, I thought these were incredibly funny stories and 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 I laugh a lot anyway. So it was really good to be in my natural habitat. I had just two suggestions. One, Michael, I understood most of your talk every once in a while, the end of the sentence would drop. 
So I couldn't hear that last word. Otherwise, very funny. Thank you so much. Anyone else? <laughs> Anyone else have feedback for the speaker? Well, as we go along here, uh, yes, Emmy, but as we go along here, please put feedback into direct chat for the speakers or to everyone so they can get feedback. And Emmy, and I believe we'll just take yours as the last one at this point. Thank you. I just wanted to say to Elena, I loved her demeanor during this speech. She appeared and looked to be the expert. <laughs> Although I think we are all experts on love in marriage, aren't we? Anyway, thank you so much for that. I just had to say that. <laughs> thank you, Emmy. Nothing like talking about relationships for a little bit of humor. So continue to share, please, feedback with the speakers uh, through chat. Let's move on now to our fourth speaker this evening, Emmy Bartholomew. Emmy says she's now giving this speech for the fourth or even fifth time. When you give a speech as a contest test speaker, you get many evaluations, but no written ones unless you enlist someone to do one for you. So Emmy says she hopes that this is the last time for this project. Help me welcome Emmy for her Confessions of a Reluctant Contestant, the Confessions of a Reluctant Contestant, Emmy Bartholomew. Are you giving your authentic message? Once upon a time, there was a most reluctant contestant. She decided that she didn't need to compete because she could get all the practice and everything that she needed by doing her pathway speeches, by joining her officer team, by joining other clubs, and working through pathway after pathway. That's all she needed. Oh, all right, all right, all right. So I am the reluctant contestant, I admit it. Then one day, my mentor said to me, Emmy, I really think you should compete this year. Why? Well, you've never really taken the opportunity to craft a speech, to hone it, to make it as close to your authentic message as it can be. So, well, I think it's time you did that. It's a gross experience. I don't think so. Then a distinguished Toastmaster said to her, may I make a suggestion? Sure. Does it make you uncomfortable to think about competing? Yes, and I just as soon not have that in my life. Hmm, that's when you should do something is when it makes you uncomfortable, when it makes you push your boundaries, when it makes you get outside your safety zone. That's when you should do something. May I suggest? that it's time for you to enter contest. All right. Little did I know that I would win at the club level. I won at the area level. I won at the division level. I won at the district level. Third place. Heck, not even that. I tied for third place. I didn't even know you could do that. But you know what? I felt like a winner. It turns out that the growth is in the doing. It's in the journey. It's not in the end result. 
And I felt like I did my very best in that contest. I felt wonderful. My friends were a little concerned. You were robbed. Oh, I don't think so. Well, I had you in first place the entire time. Well, so did I, but obviously the judges didn't. There were some wonderful things I learned along the way, some very important things. You see, when I was growing up, I was always told that I didn't handle criticism very well. I don't know what they were talking about. I didn't cry. I was fine. I just let it all run off my back. I'm a duck. Well, it appears that that was the problem. I didn't listen to criticism as they called it then. We call it feedback. You have to listen to your feedback if you're going to compete. In fact, my very first contest, I learned that very thing. I gave my speech and one of my evaluators said, you know, you call this speech the power of a smile, but I don't think it's about the smile. What? What does she know? It's my speech. It's about the smile. I went home, I reworked my speech, and I had to admit she was right. I reworked my speech, and I realized that it wasn't about the smile, it was about wearing the smile as a mask so no one could see the real me. Whoa, the new name of my speech became the price of wearing a mask. The other thing I learned in this process was that it takes a long time to do a contest speech. I worked on my speech. I gave my speech. I listened to feedback. I worked on my speech. I gave my speech. I listened to feedback. I worked on my speech. I gave my speech. I listened to feedback. I worked on my speech. Ah! It goes on and on. But by the time you're done, you have honed your speech so that your authentic message can come through. You too can do this in your life. If you listen to those parts of yourself that are uncomfortable, you can use the opportunity to push your goals, to get outside your safety zone and grow. I'll be at contest this year. Will you? Madam, Toastmaster. <laughs> Thank you so much, Emmy. Wow, life. Find the authentic message and it's in the journey. That's where the growth is. So thank you for sharing, Emmy. The next speaker of this evening is Abhijit Joshi. Abhijit thought he was so smart until he fell flat on his face and learned a lesson. Today, he is going to share the details of his move from the East Coast to the West Coast. Help me welcome Abhijit for Pennywise, Pound Foolish. Pennywise, Pound Foolish, Abhijit. I was walking down the aisle. It was not the wedding. My mother would have been very happy. It was the aisle of a Southwest plane at Boston Airport. I was very excited when I got the last seat. As I sat down, I felt very warm. Then I looked at myself. I had one, two, three, 
four, five, six layers on. I was walking like a Michelin man. But the girl next to me was not impressed. Suddenly, stop the plane, stop the plane, stop the plane. That incident taught me a lesson that I cannot be penny wise and pound foolish. I had a habit of just focusing on the small things and forget about the big picture. It was April of 2013. I just moved to the San Francisco Bay Area. I was still overcoming the sticker shock of living in California. I used to think that the ideal rent should be $490 for a two bedroom, two bath apartment as it was when I was living in the state of Alabama. I still had an apartment in Boston. My plan was to fly from San Francisco to Boston, pack up all my stuff and bring it back to San Francisco. I flew, but when I arrived at the airport, everything was a mess. There was a curfew in the city because of the Boston bombing. Somehow I got to my apartment. Because of that, because of the curfew, no one could help and come to help me to pack. It took me three days to pack. And when I was done packing, I had 14 bags. I could only take two check-in luggages and one carry-on with me, plus a laptop bag. That night, I called my ex and told her, you are not here to help me out to pack the stuff. I was so overwhelmed. But suddenly an idea came up that I'm going to call my colleague, Dan, who worked with me in the Bay Area. He used to visit us every month. Hey, Dan, would you be willing to help me? Can you take my bags and bring one bag at a time to the Bay Area? To my surprise, Dan said, yes. He came that night and took the 12 bags. But still, I was left with two big bags and plenty of clothes. Next morning was my flight. I decided, okay, I'm going to pack in the morning. When I got up, I already had missed the alarm. And I had only 30 minutes to pack. When I was done packing, there was still a lot of clothes. I decided I'm just going to put on one layer after another, 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 another. Put on my layers on the pants and PJs, everything. I called the taxi and got to the airport like 30 minutes before takeoff. I checked my luggage, went through the security. And at the security, I had to remove all my layers, my laptop, and put it on the tray. I had nearly eight trays. And I was done through security. I was waiting for my trays. I got my trays, put them on top of each other, and put, went to a corner and started putting on one layer after another, one layer after another, and rushed for my flight. I was so happy to get that flight. As soon as I sat down, I felt a relief. But suddenly I realized I forgot my work laptop in the bottom tray. I never checked it. Stop the flight, stop the flight, stop the flight. That was happening in my head. I could not stop the flight. It was not the most comfortable journey to back to the Bay Area. Immediately, I called the security for my laptop. But they said they hadn't found anything. I was worried what I'm going to do tomorrow. And I go to work. How can I tell them I lost my laptop? 
somehow I managed to get a loaner laptop. Every day for the next seven days, I called the airport. No success. As I started reflecting on what happened, I realized I'm wasting so much of time and so much stress. I could have just shipped everything. For the first time, I realized that I was penny-wise, pound-foolish, looking or focusing on the small stuff. I knew this was the end of it. What about you? Are you like me, focusing on small stuff and forgetting about the big stuff? I hope not. I encourage you to balance the small stuff as well as the big stuff. After calling the Boston security for three weeks, finally they got my laptop. And then I had to ask my uncle, who was the CEO of a company, to go to the airport, pick up the laptop and ship it to me. After that, I was never penny wise found foolish. Thank you, Abhijit, for sharing your story of stress and time and learning with us of Pennywise and Pound Foolish. Thanks. Our last speaker of this evening is Jamal George. Do you remember any of your trips? Jamal George vividly remembers this one in particular. She will take you on a journey. Please. Help me welcome Jamal George to the screen for A Trip to Remember. A Trip to Remember, Jamal. I was at the Chicago airport in the middle of July. And it was hot and I'm sweating. I look outside the window. It's snowing and the snow is three feet high. We aren't going anywhere tonight. You and me, we're stuck in this long night together. I am tired, suffocated, and I don't want to see you all. And I'm starving. Toastmasters, friends, it's eight o'clock at night. I look around for food and the food court is closing. I'm about to run, but then my carry-on bag handle raised its arm up in the air and leaned towards me saying, don't abandon me. I would never abandon my favorite Gucci bag. Come with me and I hop from one counter to another only to hear, sorry, we're closed. We're closed until I see McDonald's. I know you want it. Hot, juicy, tasty Big Mac for only $3.99. I'm about to grab it, but then I pull my hand back to get my wallet. My, my wallet. Did you see my wallet? Did any of you see my wallet? I just can't, I don't know what happened. I, I don't know where my wallet is. All my credit cards are gone and I haven't even maxed them out. Maybe the airport security officer will help me. Officer, I lost my wallet. Ma'am, when did you last see your wallet? Officer, I don't know. Ma'am, did you lose your wallet? Officer, why am I talking to you? Yes, I lost my wallet. Ma'am, please calm down. Please show me your ID. ID? Yes. This. Ma'am, your ID. ID is a phone card. Is, is a paper card with your name and photo. Oh, that ID? That ID is in my wallet. And my wallet also has my boyfriend's number that I don't want my husband to see. Ma'am, sorry, we need your ID to help you. Officer! 
What a waste of time. I am starving and my stomach is grumbling. My survival instincts kick in and I see a half-eaten egg roll and I grab it and I inhale it before anybody else does. And I look everywhere, high, low, behind the chair, above the cupboard, for my wallet, even in the trash can. Even though I live in Silicon Valley, have a nice job, a home, and a family, here I am, penniless, with no identity in Chicago. As the hours go by, it's getting cold and quieter at night. I see a chair, and I sit on it, thinking I could fall asleep. But then I just couldn't fall asleep. I dragged myself to the restroom and there it was. The hand dryer, the hand dryer is so much fun to play with. It is love at first sight. I hit the button for the hot gush of air and I'm enjoying my newfound companion and I fall asleep tired. I wake up after a few hours drooling and sticky and I go to the bathroom, to the washroom and I just flush my face with water and it just wets my shirt that I'm wearing. Oh, what did I just do? I open the bag to get a new clothes and as soon as I put my hand in, deep in, I could feel something solid. I slowly take it out. My wallet! My wallet is hiding exactly where I placed it hours earlier. What was I thinking? What was I thinking? Maybe, just maybe, I go a little crazy when I get hungry. Walking with my wallet, and my carry-on bag, I see people all relieved and a sign that says boarding to San Francisco. I get on the plane and I reach safely back home. This trip reminds me that life is filled with experiences and we face new experiences every single day. Say yes to every experience, no matter how pleasant or unpleasant, it is temporary. This awareness helps me to bounce back and be fully me. Now, what would you do when faced with an unexpected situation, just like I had at the airport? Will you panic? No, just face it. Back to you. Thank you, Jamal, for sharing your experience of penniless in Chicago with no wallet and then the rewards of it having been reunited with you. May we please have our speakers on the screen for, let's say, about three to four minutes of round robin. Do you have feedback to our speakers, please? We should have Emmy on the screen as well. Thank you so much. You turn your camera on. There we go. Do we have feedback for the speakers? I'll check gallery view here. Sandra? Yes. In the cheap seats. Thank yes, you. we can. Thank you. <laughs> what I really appreciated of all three of our speakers this evening is misdirection and exaggeration. Jamal was the most recent example of the hand dryer. It was something that we were expecting her to find her wallet, but she found the, the hand dryer and that was a misdirection well used. The other thing is just the over exaggeration of things that we in our minds start to make bigger, right? Because any situation that we're in, we make that situation bigger, losing something. As the timer, you'll get your own titles of your speeches when I give you your timing report, but thank you very much for providing misdirection and exaggeration to keep us, or to keep me um, entertained and engaged. Thank you. Thank you, Joanna. Uh, what did you like about these speeches? Learn, yes. Thank you, Terry. 
I love the surprises. It made me laugh over and over again, the surprises you all three brought into this picture. <laughs> so thank you so much. <laughs> thank you. We're definitely seeing a lot of surprises actually in all of these. Thank you. Anyone else? What did you like? What might work better? What were your favorites? Favorite points? I really like how all three speakers were using body language, very in tune with delivery of the story. And it was really entertaining and funny, all three of you. Thank you. Anyone else? Yeah, others here. Yes. Yes, I loved the speech by all, all speakers especially the main reason for that is all of them used body language, gestures, I mentioned the vocal variety, the pauses, all wonderfully well. And they made, I don't know the word to say that, uh, there were surprises in their speech. I was expecting something. I was expecting they would say this, however, to my surprise, towards the end, they said this, which made it a humorous speech too. And it's one, one last thing to say about this is, this is the first time I have experienced and noticed six speakers together in a session. I have not noticed. So generally I've seen two speakers, maximum three speakers, but never six speakers. And all of you are doing it with a smile and keeping all of us also smile. Thank you all. Oh, thank you so much, Ardesh. They were really outstanding tonight and I appreciate their their time and their wonderful speeches. It was excellent. Thank you. Well, let's move on now, please, to uh, the, yes? Did I hear someone? Uh, All Linda right. Had. Ex uh, yeah, guest Linda would like to say something. Oh, Linda, where are, okay, Linda, please, where are you? No, She's on. I'm here. I oh, know yeah, you have thank time you. limits, but I just wanted to thank each and every one of you because it was so relatable. Believe it or not, I felt like I was living through the same experiences because I had. So it was funny. It's like, were they behind me on my shoulder? Did they know that I had gone through all those same situations between New York to Chicago, Atlanta, California? And did they know I lost my wallet? How did you know I did that? It did the same thing. It was incredible. So I appreciate each and every speech means I can be behind you and related to it. And I love the expression, vocabulary. Well, I vocal variety should mention, and even standing up, shoulders, gestures, hand, body. Excellent job. Thank you so much. Oh, and thank you, Linda, for sharing it. They were very relatable, as you mentioned. Thank you. And now let's transition, please, to our Table Topics Master, Michael Nile. We will have six minutes for Table Topics, please. Thank you, Michael Nile. Start talking. Right, start talking and they'll follow me. I'm over here. <laughs> <laughs> Whatever. You can hear me, right? Thank you, Madam Toastmaster. I hope everybody was listening in the introduction when we learned about humor and we listened to these great speeches with humor in them. One of the best ways to create humor is to learn to laugh at ourselves. We do stupid things all the time and we embarrass ourselves and we make mistakes. And if we learn to laugh at ourselves, we can use that humor in our speeches and talks. So some of the questions I'm gonna ask in table topics tonight are directly related at you. You have one to two minutes, <clears throat> Heimer mentioned, and I am going to ask for volunteers, all of our guests, you're welcome to jump in and talk about your experiences. I will have Elena who is going to monitor who puts her hands up. Well, so do Linda, I have a volunteer? Linda can also see it. So, I can see it? Linda can also see it. Yeah. All right. Do we have someone to hand up? Let's see. Oh, Look at the hands up. Lori Whaley. Thank you. Here's Lori. Oh, no, Lori Whaley. Oh, ready to go? Oh, Joanna is going to start this off because I got the best question for Joanna. 
The question for you, Joanna, is have you ever done something truly embarrassing when you thought nobody was watching, only to find out that somebody actually was watching you? Okay. Thank you, Mr. Table Topics Master, all the time. If you hear me laughing and you don't know what happened, I tripped. That's just what happens. I'll see you next year. But I was just recently thinking about something that I've done. And I want to share this with you. And I want to see what kind of reaction that I get from you. When my daughter was younger, she forced me into a relationship with another mother because she wanted to be friends with this little girl. And this little girl moved like molasses. Everything was slow. As if everybody else was in warm speed. <clears throat> To teach her a lesson, because I was a horrible parent, to teach her a lesson, when we were getting in the car, baby was strapped in, my daughter was sitting in the middle seat, all upset because she was in the middle seat. Brittany hadn't gotten to the car yet. Everybody else was in the car, radio on, ignition on, windows down, but no Brittany. Brittany reaches her little hand out for the handle. I cock the lock. <laughs> Poor child. It's locked. I unlock it. And her mom says, no, it's not. It's fine. Get in the car. Brittany reaches a little hand out again. I pop the lock again. <laughs> Did it the third time. And her mom, by this time, was at her limit. Get in the car. What are you doing? Why are you wasting time? You're always wasting time. And I'm like, yes, thank you. So Brittany gets in the car. That happened. 20 years ago. And I laugh like a fool every single time that I remember this. And I admit, now that I'm 50, I was a horrible parent, I was a horrible listener to be, and a horrible thing to do to a young lady, a young eight year old. Oh, but guess what? You all are laughing too. Mr. Table, not a lesson. Thank you, Joanna. Do we have uh, another volunteer? Elena? No. I'm looking. I'm looking. I'm looking. Help me out. Help me out. Uh, we can Mike, fix excuse me, Michael. We have a guest. Janice had her hand up. Excellent. Welcome, Janice. Hi, Dad. Janice, yes. I have a question for you. That's what they do. Okay. Have you ever had a time in your life, maybe you're in a foreign country, maybe you're in a library and you were giving sign language, or you were communicating with someone and you both thought you understood each other, but it turned out you absolutely didn't. Mr. Table Topping Master, fellow Toastmasters. Okay language. All right. Let me, uh, let me tell you that I speak Cantonese. So that's my second language. English is my first language. So Mandarin is not any of my languages. Even though I took four years of it, you'd think I would get it right. So I went to China with three other people who really did not speak any Mandarin. So out of the four of us, I looked like the total genius. So what happened was I figured, unfortunately, that I have to be the only one that can order food. There we are. We are ordering food in Thailand. And the only, they speak Mandarin there for some strange reason, but they do. And so I had decided that I had to go order food. Now, have you ever tried to order food in a Thai restaurant where there's no English? And then you have to go figure out, look at the, just decide what it could it possibly be. And you order maybe eggs or something like that. And so I asked, is this eggs? Yeah, 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 yeah. And that's the first thing to learn in any country. Anybody that says yeah, 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 yeah to you very quickly probably does not understand you. And I've had that to happen to me several times. And so again, Thailand, order some food. 
And let's just say I should have trusted my guts and just ordered vegetables because at least I know what they look like. But with Thai food, no, I did not get my eggs. I had to get my chicken. I did not, I don't know what the hell I got. But let's just say when you go to a foreign country and want to order something, Make sure somebody next to you knows how to speak the language so you can order the food that you need to order. Otherwise, that's pretty much what happens to me. Back to you, Mr. Table Topping Master. Thank you so much for sharing that, Janice. We greatly appreciate that. We are, however, behind schedule here, so I'm gonna turn it back over to our Toastmaster, Sandra. Thank you. Thank you so much, Michael. Our next role on the agenda is the general evaluator for feedback on the meeting. Please welcome Terry. All right, thank you. Well, we had a very fun meeting tonight. From the beginning, it was a blast. We had our postmaster giving us ideas of how to make things funny, the rules of humor. It's our meeting got rolling pretty quickly and just kept going. We had a little glitch with our Pledge of Allegiance, but we got through it just fine. We had one speaker after another with so much fun to share. Oh my gosh, I laughed so much. And there was such a wide variety of things. Everyone had wonderful things to share. Michael Maddox, you cracked me up with your <laughs> with your ideas of marriage and pickleball. Uh, so the official state of official sport of Washington State, I didn't know that. I know pickleball players though. Um, the saying I'm sorry is the survival of marriage. I thought that was great. And in pickleball, you don't have to say you're sorry. Um, two, Tom Jacobs, who gave us his story about the raven and losing his phone. Oh my gosh. Yeah, we had quite a quite a, a lovely <laughs> rendition of that. Thank you for that fun. Elena, you really cracked me up with your story and the way you, you didn't just tell it, the way you enacted it and shared it with your gestures and your tone and everything that you, that you brought it to life with. It was, it was a blast. Uh, I liked your, your statement, a woman with a purse and a purpose. <laughs> so of course you had aspirins available. <laughs> Emmy, I've heard that speech before, but it was so alive for me tonight. I heard things I hadn't heard before and it really made me laugh and it, and I just really enjoyed it so much. It was so encouraging and fun. It doesn't mean I'm ready to compete, but it, but I really took your point in and it was fun. <laughs> um, Abhijit, oh my gosh, you cracked me up. I did not expect when you had those layers that you went to the airport with all layers on and then you had to i mean i just was at the airport not long ago so to go through the security and you want to take it all off and then they're going to check you and oh you set off the beeper and now you got to do this and your your computer's going in separately oh my gosh i could i was just right there with you ex experiencing that it was just hilarious and then we had um I think uh, Jamal was next, yes. Oh my gosh, and that was so funny too. And I have done that, put things away and then thought, where did I, what happened to my wallet or whatever it was and tickets sometimes or something. And there they are, right? Where, oh yeah, I put them there. <laughs> but you, you added things into that story that were just really fun and exciting. <laughs> so I really appreciated that. The round robin was fun. People had fun things to share. Everybody cooperated with kind of keeping things moving. It was just a delight. It's so fun to have so many guests here tonight experiencing this with us and letting it be fun for us to share it with you. And Michael Nile, even though you got kind of stopped a little short the table topics were perfect for people to share and and just keep the joy going with this evening so thank you all so much for this i, I really had a great time hope you all did too back to you Ms. table topics i mean and that, thank you <laughs> and thank you terry may we please welcome joanna up for the timers report okay good evening and thank you for your speeches this evening and also paid attention to the flags. So for our speakers this evening, Michael Maddox, 
gave us the introduction of a simile of pickleball and marriage for six minutes and 34 seconds. Tom Jacobs gave us his tale of losing his head to the heat for four minutes and 45 seconds. Elena Brenner gave us her rules for long lasting love for six minutes and 43 seconds. Annie Bartholomew gave her last speech for the last time, six minutes and 52 seconds. Alajit, I have a quandary here, sir, because I really want to say that instead of your, your title being pay attention to the big things, 12 bags is the proof of friendship for six minutes and 55 seconds. And Jamal, finding the unexpected where you put it for five minutes and 56 seconds. For our total time for table topics, seven minutes and 10 seconds is what we took for that. I probably took the majority of that time. <sighs> Sandra asked me to time each and every segment of the meeting, which is why I'm giving the additional timing. For our opening, Emmy, your opening was supposed to be one minute. It was two minutes and, 20, and 29 seconds. Abhijit trying to save some time instead of his one to four minutes, he gave us 24 seconds of an opening. Thank you, sir. Our general evaluator, Terry Barrett, three minutes and 19 seconds. Thank you very much, ma'am. And Sandra, you are the winner of Time Suck. So you okay. went through all of my screens that I have for, to show people that they're over time. So I need to have some new material. So thank you for identifying my need for new material. Your max was 10 minutes. Ma'am, you came in at a total of 18 minutes and 47 seconds. Back to you. All right, thank you so much. Joanna. And before I close off and pass to our president, I would just say a heartfelt thank you to all of our speakers and presenters tonight. The speeches were amazing. I laughed all through every one of them. They were incredibly relatable, funny, picturesque, love the body language and facial expression. So thank you. And I would like to especially thank our guests for coming tonight. Our meeting now is turned over to President Abhijit. Thank you so much. Thank you, Sandra, for putting this meeting together. I really enjoyed it. So thank you for doing all the hard work in the background. We'll now go for guest feedback. Janice, how was your experience today? I totally enjoyed myself. Thank you so much for allowing me to be present. And definitely, Abhijin, I love your story about wearing way too much it's there's a story actually there are stories about that at the airport so i do enjoy that you have joined that particular lore of those kind of stories thank you back to you thank you Janice. dennis how was your experience i really enjoyed the meeting i appreciate uh, your engagement it's an excellent club uh, and how you put all this program together and I really learned and I'm encouraged to use humor more in my speeches because I think I'm not so funny. <laughs> so it was variety of use, uh, ways of using humor and I'm encouraged, especially uh, with San uh, Sandra sharing tips at the beginning. Thank you, I appreciate it, I enjoy it. Lovely to hear that. Ditti? Uh, uh, thanks to all of you. It's really uh, made my morning a really good morning. This morning, uh, it's really good morning for me today. You made me laugh and all, all the lessons. It's really wonderful and great. You know? Thanks to all of you. Thanks so much. Thank you, Dipti. Thank you for joining us. Adash. Thank you all for providing me a wonderful session. My feedback is this was the most amazing humor session I have attended so far. I'm not making it long. The great thing which I 
the one great thing, a great thing which I loved is there was a mention that humor can be learned. I have not heard about that before, so I'm really impressed by that statement. I think I believe that it can be done, and my appreciate appreciation to the Toastmaster of the day, Sandra. She has done wonderfully well today. Sandra, all over the meeting, everyone has delivered well, and for me. I attended. I will make it short. I attended few Toastmasters even in the morning. It's it was starting at uh, seven o'clock in the morning here. So for the past few weeks, Toastmasters has been the breakfast of my day. So from seven o'clock to nine o'clock, I would be attending Toastmasters. Even. Thank you so much. Thank you all. Thank you so much, Adarsh. Susan, I would like to thank you for the invite. This was delightful. Every one of the speakers was top notch. I'd seen ME before at one other contest where she was the test speaker, but it still was brand new and fresh. So I thank you for that. I have never seen you, Vajit, speak, give a speech. And I just was so delighted. Jay Mal, I met you by going to interpersonal out here in, in 101, even though I'm part of the East Coast of the US. I was so delighted to be here. Thank you. I've learned something. I belong to seven clubs. Otherwise, I would consider joining. I'm running shy on time. Thank you. Thank you, Susan. Great to have you. Linda, how was your experience? Oh, I just loved it tonight. Thank you so much. I saw the captivation in the ad and said, well, I've got to join and watch this because I need a little bit of humor. You know, everything that we're going through. When I get off of work, I just want to laugh and just relieve and enjoy it and thank you. The speeches were fantastic. I love each and every one. I love how you had the meeting with the contest, engaging with the audience as well. Yes, definitely would love to come visit you again. Thank you, Linda. Rekha, how was your experience? Thank you for inviting me today to this meeting. I was very happy to be here. I love how the Toastmaster walked us initially through the different kinds of uh, humorous strategies. I never, um, thought that there were strategies to this. So I will definitely take that with me. And uh, I am way too serious. So this session was so much fun that I am learning to lighten up. So thank you so much. It was wonderful. Thank you so much, Rita. This was actually Sandra's idea. And she started working on it like two or three months ago. So thank you, Sandra, one more time for putting this together, an amazing show. We will meet again next month, first Thursday at 6.30 p.m. Pacific time. Looking forward to seeing you on next Thursday, the first Thursday of the month. This meeting is adjourned. Thank you. Yeah. Okay, before we go.